how can we expect ourselves to have lives of joy and freedom and spiritual clarity when we are sowing the seeds of the opposite of that? It's almost like some mad scientist, like Satan himself, <laughs> designed these systems that are being used now to raise animals. It's in, it, it is absolute insanity. I don't get how you can love everything Jesus says and then participate in a mechanized uh, system of mass slaughter that involves pain beyond your wildest imagination. Even keeping quiet and silent about the violence, you are part of that violence. There's another passage in the Quran that says that uh, because of the wrongs of humanity, there has been much corruption seen in the oceans and, and, and on land. So for a few moments in which we're enjoying what is really just a palate preference, we're taking what is most essential to animals, you know, their very lives. And uh, that's the opposite of compassion, it seems to me. It's we are ashamed of our ancestors who owned slaves. We are ashamed of our ancestors who believed in segregation. So too, our grandchildren will be ashamed of what we allowed to happen on our watch. Each of us has to ask ourselves a spiritual question. What side do I want to tell my grandchildren I was on? Was I on the side of mercy and compassion? Or was I on the blind side that helped to perpetuate suffering? It's the light of mine, I'm the light it shine. It's the light of mine. Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. This is Plant Based News and I'm Robbie Lockie. I'm really excited to have two guests here today to talk about a brand new film called A Prayer for Compassion. We have Victoria Moran and also Thomas Jackson joining us who are instrumental in the creation and production of this film. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi. So Victoria, would you like to start off uh, by just introducing yourself and talking a little bit about how you fit into the vegan world? Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, I've been around it quite a long time. I actually lived in London. Uh, woo, I'm going to tell you how old I am or you can figure it out. Um, I moved there in 1968, right out of high school in Kansas City, Missouri in, in the US. And that was where I became vegetarian. I heard about vegan a few years later, but I was dealing with an eating disorder and I had a hard time making it all the way to vegan. But um, when I eventually did, I went back to the UK to do research for a book that became Compassion, the Ultimate Ethic, um, where I met some of the wonderful early um, vegans um, who had been around in the 1940s. And so um, I, I, I set my, my vegan date at 1983. And then my connection to this film was that I have a podcast called Main Street Vegan. And one day this lovely gentleman, your other guest, um, called in and asked if I would produce his film. And because it was about my two passions, veganism and spirituality, I came on board and that was three and a half years ago and now we have a movie. Amazing. And and that's great. I'm really, really excited for the for the release of this film here in the UK. Just to everyone who's watching, we're actually going to be doing the UK premiere of the film on the 23rd of May at Prince Charles Theatre. So um, if you're watching this and you haven't got your tickets yet, please click the link in the description to grab your tickets. Right. So, Thomas, tell us a little bit about um, how your journey and how everything began for you. Well, you know, uh, 20 years ago, I went to graduated from film school. About the same time I'm finishing this film, I had finished a student film that won a student academy award and a student Emmy and got me in front of a lot of people. And at the time I was kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to say and I didn't really know. So I kind of went on a spiritual path and it led me to New York eventually where I lived for seven years. And within while I was in New York, I was attending a unity church. And at the unity church, I was learning all about um, <laughs> about the connectedness of all things and about Jesus's teachings of love and compassion. I grew up uh, Southern Baptist, so I'd already learned a lot of Jesus's teachings. Mm -hmm. um, but it was those things that, uh, this was 2005, that kind of led me to be uh, moved to a nonviolent diet. 
I didn't know what vegan was. I just, I knew what vegetarian was, so I became vegetarian. And the first week I went to a deli and ordered something and said, make it vegetarian. And the guy said, do you want vegan or vegetarian? I'm like, uh, what's vegan? He's like, well, there's no animal products in vegan. And I, at the time, I didn't, there wasn't a YouTube and I didn't know what this was about. And mm -hmm. I said, uh, my inside, I said, I don't know what that's about, but make it vegan. Mm -hmm. And I've been vegan ever since. Mm -hmm. I never yes. heard that story, Thomas. Mm -hmm. You're the yeah, only you know, person I know who got to be vegan because of a deli guy. Um, <laughs> and, he, and he wasn't vegan. It was like, you know, it was so... It is amazing. It amazing. Amazing. Those, and, the those, those, and the way I yeah. found out about what was happening is I started uh, going to the supervegan.com. I don't know if you remember that, Victoria, but mm -hmm. they had all the places in New York where all the vegan food was. So yeah. I would go there for that and I would see the blog. So I would get a little bit then, but... Being uh, my teaching spiritual path was really not to judge people and uh, to live and let live. I didn't know many vegans. Um, I didn't know any vegans. I knew a couple vegetarians, but like I said, nobody had mentioned it to me. And then um, I guess 15 years later, you know, my daughter was born. I had decided at the time just to be a live and let live vegan, uh, be an example for people because I didn't know any vegans. And it was either I have no friends or... You know, and so I didn't know what was really going on until I saw Cowspiracy mm -hmm. as far as the environment. Mm -hmm. And my daughter was two years old at the time. And I did the math and figured out what was going on. And it was just like, I have to do something here. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know what I had to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was working on a, a different feature film at the time, helping somebody else with their feature film. And I started praying and meditating about it. And this question popped into my mind that came into my mind at unity when I used to go to brunch with these ministers and chaplains who would be teaching me all of these compassionate messages and about the interconnectedness. And then I'd see them order, you know, veal or mm. some kind of meat. And inside I would go, how is it possible that a compassionate spiritual person that believes these things, that believes in a loving God, that believes in compassion and kindness for all, could be participating in this? Mm. Well, at the time, like I said, who am I to judge? I was new into unity. But at this point, seeing Cowspiracy, when the question came back to me, it kind of came with this caveat of, you need to make a film about this. Mm. So the first thing I did was research. It's that somebody done this. I know how much, I'm a single dad. I live in an RV in the woods. I don't have the money to do this thing. I know what it takes to make a film. Mm. So I researched and nobody had done it. So I'm like, okay, uh, what's the first thing you want me to do? Mm. I've meditated and clears a bell, I heard, Call Victoria Moran and ask her to be a producer to connect you with the people you've been hearing on her podcast. And so I did. And at every step of the way, it has been meditate and pray, mm -hmm. guidance, somebody coming in mm -hmm. to provide the way. It's been a magical journey mm -hmm. for sure. Amazing. When you ask the big questions, the answers will find their way to you. <laughs> yeah. So so um, I take it you're both uh, your your faith is Christian. Uh, well, I grew up Baptist, but I, you know, I, for that, myself, I'm what's the difference spiritual. between Baptist and Christian? Uh, well, Baptist is a, one of the denominations of Christian. Okay. But since uh, since I've been grown, I've studied many traditions, and mm. I've one of the things as a young man, I was in, I was introduced to Bruce Lee through mm. movies, you know, and I read mm. his book, uh, The Tao of Jake Undo, and in it he had this quote, and he said he studied many traditions. And he was talking about karate and kung fu. He said, mm -hmm. I studied many traditions and I kept what worked for me and I let go of the rest. And as a young man, that somehow sunk in my, my psyche. And that's what I've done with all the religions I've studied. I found so many truths and the truths are the same in all the religions mm -hmm. and all the spiritualities. They're the same truth. So I'm more of a truth seeker. I'm a follower of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call myself a Christian at the time because there's a lot of things that go with that title right now. Mm -hmm. And I just really feel like Jesus is my, is who I follow as mm -hmm. far as his teaching. But yeah, because Jesus wasn't a Christian, was he? And neither, exactly. you know, Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. And, exactly. uh, you know, all these religious kind of uh, teachers, they, they were just sharing wisdom and knowledge and they were guiding people um, to live a more compassionate life. They wanted people to be kinder. And there is that harmony between all religions. And unfortunately, this is the difference between religion and spirituality. Um, and, you know, religion is a man-made construct. It's a, it's a kind of framework that's been created and built up like an edifice around uh, spiritual practices. And these are whether these temples and churches. When I was a child, my grandmother always said to me, you know, God is and all that is is God. And no matter what um, umbrella you stand underneath, 
God is you and also the umbrella. Um, and that, you know, God, or whatever you want to call the God, or Allah, or whoever, Jehovah, whatever, you know, God is something that uh, permeates all things. But um, I grew up uh, Presbyterian um, and uh, had also Catholic family as well, so I was very surrounded by the Christian faith. I grew up in a very small town, um, and it was a real kind of paradox for me because on one hand, I'd be dragged to church on a Sunday where we were, you know, compassion and kindness to others was being espoused, but then I often saw those same people speaking in very uh, aggressive and angry ways about certain types of people. Um, so growing up, I had a real kind of like struggle with religion. I, I never felt, I felt like it was very bipolar <laughs> and it didn't really kind of give me what I needed. Um, and uh, I now am a practicing Buddhist, but it's very interesting the connection between Christianity, Buddhism and veganism because, you know, obviously I was born Christian, became a Buddhist and then began to ask a question. And I guess Christians ask this as well, who are now vegan, you know, if we're going out into the world talking about compassion and kindness, when we sit down three times a day and consume violence on our plates, um, you know, are we really living in alignment with who we truly are as religious or spiritual people? Um, Victoria, obviously with your podcast, you have um, and speak to a lot of people and you said you have a passion for uh, religion or spirituality and veganism. How do you think um, we can come to terms with the fact that there are so many people in the world who practice religions like Christianity, Buddhism, uh, Islam, and they all focus on compassion, but then a lot of these people are, are oblivious to the violence that, are, that is going on on their plates. I love that you use the word oblivious. I just edited uh, a book that a, a wonderful a writer here in the States, uh, Sandy Nasanowitz, wrote called Oblivious, right. Her Journey to Veganism. Wow. And how, you know, she was a yoga teacher and all these things, but oblivious to what goes on with the animals. And I think that's what happens with so many people, whether they identify as religious or not. Mm. We're just going on about our lives, doing what society says it takes to be a good person. Mm. And lo and behold, there's this other thing going on, this mm. tremendous suffering, this this awful, you'd really just have to call it a sin mm. that, that is happening. But people either don't know about it or they've been so brainwashed that, well, it looks really bad, but, and then there's the whole list of, but that's what they're here for, or we really need the mm. protein mm -hmm. or whatever it is that people use Justification. Uh, to justify yeah. something that when you really, really take it into your heart, whatever your belief system in terms of the great beneficence is, you've just got to see this is wrong and the freedom. To me, mm. when I became a vegan, it was a spiritual experience. Mm. It was just this lifting of, of this burden of knowing that I was contributing to this suffering and then I was not. And, you know, I think of those lines in Amazing Grace. It really was like I was blind mm. to what was going on, all the suffering. Mm -hmm. And then when I was finally able to see, and I couldn't see it clearly until I stopped eating the products. Mm. You know, when I saw it and I was still dealing with my binge eating and I'd go back to dairy and whatnot, I saw, but I didn't see. Mm. And once those foods were gone, this is one reason why... I just love it when people go vegan for any reason, and even if they want to call themselves plant-based or whatever, that's fine. Because once you stop consuming animals, mm. it really helps open your eyes. Is there any research <laughs> for that kind of process that you know of? Because a lot of we hear a lot of people say that that they stop consuming animals and they change something inside them changes. They feel like, you know, their hearts open. They feel more compassion. Um, are, have they? Do you know of any studies that have happened to sort of test whether there is any kind of measurable change within a person's biochemistry. Wow. No, I, I think a study like that would be a little bit hard to, mm. to get funding for, but mm. maybe somebody listening to this <laughs> is just sitting on a pile of money wanting to do some fabulous vegan research. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, though, my experience traveling in the last three and a half years interviewing people who are vegan, mm. these are the things that I, I've seen consistent. Mm. Within two to three weeks, their health begins to improve. Mm. Most people, if they have medication, they come off them. Something happens that they feel it physically. Mm. Now, everyone that I interviewed within a year to two had this 
more peace in their heart, felt more connected to all things. Mm -hmm. felt, if they were on the spiritual felt path, felt more connected to their spiritual path. It's like this numbness and guilt that you have to hold inside to consume this melts away and your heart softens. It's over and over and over. I've seen it. And what's really cool is this film has been making vegans and some of them I'm in contact with and I'm encouraging and I'm hearing their stories mm -hmm. and I'm seeing it happening. I guess it happens. It doesn't take a year to a year and a half. I'm already seeing it happen in some right away. Mm -hmm. And so what Victoria was saying, no matter what path they entered in, some people were, get, were for health, some were for the environment. But whatever they entered, their hearts started softening and they understood the animals. We're seeing it in celebrities like Will I Am mm -hmm. and people like that. Kevin Smith, people who come in for their health, but you see them soften to the animals. It's mm -hmm. a natural thing because once you don't have the guilt of hurting these animals, you can look them in the eye, mm -hmm. feel who they are, mm -hmm. connect with all beings and have and know that you're not causing any unnecessary harm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. A prolific uh, a ve a vegan activist, James Aspie from Australia. Shout out to James. James, before he was vegan, he was not into animals at all. In fact, he couldn't stand them. He thought they were dirty, smelly creatures, and he didn't feel anything. Um, and he, when he began his journey, and a man he met on a boat said to him, it uh, sounds very mystical. A man he met on a boat um, said to him, you know, eating and killing animals is bad karma. You know, it began, the cogs began to move in James's head. And he went from someone who was not really fussed about whether animals lived or died to someone who's dedicated every moment of his life to, to fighting for the rights and lives of animals, which is incredible. So really anyone, absolutely anyone can change. One of my... Um, favorite quotes I love about this sort of side of things and it's quite dark but I'm going to read it anyway and it says and it's by William In Inge or Inge and it says we have enslaved the rest of animal creation and have treated our distant cousins in fur and feathers so badly that beyond doubt if they were able to formulate a religion they would depict the devil in human form as yeah. two spiritual people how does that make you feel Victoria would you like to start well I think it's the truth and I think that that's why we're in the beginning stages of coming out of this. Mm. And I think so often if there was a way that we could know where we are in this particular struggle, I think about the abolition of human slavery movement and people were working tirelessly on that in, in, in the UK, in the US, as far back as the late 1500s, the mm. 1600s. Mm. And they had no way of seeing how much longer that struggle was going to last. So I don't know for us in animal liberation, whether we're in, in 1600 or 1850, <laughs> but I feel like we're closer to 1850 mm. because so many things are happening because of the internet. People are coming on board. People are, are shown images. Many people relate, many people connect. Mm. And so veganism is growing like wildfire mm. and, and films like Thomas's makes such a difference because people are, are so changed mm. when they see the images and there are flashes of images in here that a lot of people say, oh, why'd you have to put those there? Because of the obliviousness, mm. people who don't know need to see, but then Thomas is so skillful in bringing people out from, oh my God, there's this horrible suffering and here's, here are these animals who've been liberated. Here are these animals mm. at a sanctuary. Here are these beautiful people from every faith. It's so ecumenical, every kind of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism. He even found a Zoroastrian oh, wow. who is a, a vegan veterinarian in, mm. in Los Angeles, Dr. Armighty May. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful way of saying, okay, right now there are people with that mystical kind of faith, you know, you can have just a religious person who follows all the rules and, and doesn't have that, that heart softening that Thomas talked about. Mm -hmm. But these people that he talks to in the film are these people who touch the life of, of their spiritual tradition and then they give it wings. Mm -hmm. You know, they say, okay, I'm saying I'm compassionate and now I'm going to act in a compassionate way toward all beings mm. and power comes from that. Mm. And yes, I, I think your, your writer is absolutely correct. The animals would <clears throat> think we were the devil mm. and yet some of us are angels and we're trying to make the whole world angelic mm. for the animals. Amazing. Any thoughts on that, Thomas? <clears throat> yes. You know, I, I was thinking the other day that if, 
if you take life and you spell it backwards, it's evil. Mm. So, so evil is kind of the anti-life. Mm. And what is more anti-life than an industry that is number one at destroying the planet, number one at uh, uh, species extinction, ocean, ocean dead zones, number one at killing trillions of animals every year? Mm. How more anti-life? For the create and destroying human health. Mm. So you've got the body temple, you've got all of creation, you've got uh, all the animals that we were given dominion of, which actually means to be stewards of. Mm. And you'll see in the film where it's broken down. So I feel what you said earlier, alignment. When it comes down to it, it really is about alignment. And this is what I've come to realize is that all of the paths I studied, if you studied their teachings of compassion, every path is not only in alignment with veganism. If you're a vegan, you are truly living their teachings of compassion. Mm. You are you are not just contemplating them, theorizing about them. You are living them every day. You're mm. living your truth. Mm -hmm. You're in alignment with your truth. Mm. So Silish, Dr. Silish Rao in the film, he has a moment where he says, when what you say and what you do are out of alignment, you suffer. Mm. Well, when he first said that three years ago, I didn't quite understand it. But, you know, I've seen it over mm. and over and over. Mm. I see it in the people in my family and in other friends who are having to take, you know, I've seen so many people cure themselves of all of these from arthritis to hypertension to even cancer. All of these things these people are curing themselves of. And I'm seeing my same people in my family going to the hospital for these same illnesses while I'm seeing these other people. Mm. So I'm seeing a lot of unnecessary suffering. So mm. in the end, I feel like we have to, if you want to be in alignment, whatever the spiritual path, you have to be pro uh, all of creation, mm. pro love and compassion for all creation. Mm. And so being a vegan, whether you're a spiritual person, whether you're a religious person, you're already living the compassion at the heart of all of the traditions, mm. at least the ones I've uh, studied. And mm -hmm. There may be some that don't have compassion, but mm. I haven't found those yet. No, absolutely. And that's the foundation of all religion is to alleviate and remove suffering from life. And that's why all the spiritual men and women of the world, ex you know, I think this is what why they existed. They're teachers coming into this world to give us reminders about what matters in life. What matters is kindness, compassion, how we treat others you know, uh, karma in Buddhism, the law of cause and effect, what you think, say and do with every moment creates change in the world. And it's really, really important for us to, as spiritual people, I think, is to lead by example and to kind of uh, share that with, uh, with in, in such a way that is um, accessible to, to all people, religious, spiritual or not. Um, I was Buddhist for, for seven, eight, nine, ten years, and I questioned why am I going out and, and and kind of talking about compassion and kindness, but then I'm eating animals. I just, it, there was something just sort of clicked in my mind. But if someone had come along to me and said, to be a Buddhist, you have to be a vegan, I would never have done it. I would have never have done it. And this is the tricky thing with religion and spirituality is that if you create too many rules and frameworks, including veganism, around the borders of this ideology or this way of being and thinking, it's quite hard for people to come in because they look at their lives and they think, I could never be like that. I could never be like Victoria. I could never be like Thomas. You know, they kind of put people who they see as spiritual or religious up on a pedestal. And, and you know, we're humans. We're infallible. We've got our, our idiosyncrasies and that's the thing. And I think this is where vulnerability and honesty really comes in. As people, it's important for us to show that our honesty and our vulnerability. Um, and I think, you know, films like this, really do that they say look at us we're uh, imperfect beings but we're all doing our best aren't we <laughs> and the thing that you said robbie i think is so important if people who are part of some kind of spiritual community and i love that you mentioned karma because thomas talks with a lot of jains uh, in the film as well and they have such an exquisite understanding of, of karma yeah. but anybody who, who's who's in a church or who's who's in a yoga center whatever it is can shine their light and, and, you know, the, the old joke about how do you know somebody's vegan, don't worry, they'll tell you. But it does, it just kind of radiates. It's like you go out to eat with people and you're eating vegan. And and then, if like they say in the 12-step programs, if you have something that somebody else wants, they're going to go to any length to get it. Mm. So instead of, of telling people, oh, well, you're not a good Buddhist or a good whatever, you have to be vegan, 
you just be vegan, be there for information, yep. and, and live aspirationally, which is tough because, like you say, we're all imperfect and mm. we all have all kinds of things to improve. Mm. And yet still, there's just something about hanging on to that compassion at the core mm. that it shines. And people see it and then people want to know more. Some mm. people, the mm. people who are ready. So going into the film, talk us through um, the, the framework of the film and what, uh, what kind of things can we expect to learn without obviously giving away too much about the film. Thomas? Oh, well, I'll tell you, I just want to touch on what Victoria said about the graphic images because, honestly, I really walked a fine line between, what's, um, between showing what's truth and what they're talking about, what the people are talking about, and showing what's it's doable what you can take there's nothing bloody everything's less than two seconds if you have a feeling you can't handle this you can you can handle this mm. i wouldn't bring young children who don't know anything about what's going on to it but we have had children who know what's happening and they've seen it mm. uh there's a uh, for me it, in the end it's a very inspirational uplifting message because one of the things i've learned is you don't judge people you do exactly what victoria says you bring this thing that you have this gold that everybody should want mm -hmm. and honor it like that yourself and they'll want it. So the film basically is um, my journey of uh, trying to make a better world for my daughter. Mm -hmm. So it, you kind of get the idea of how, what we talked about earlier, how I became vegan and where I came from. As far as Southern Baptist, I was not always vegan. I ate all the standard American diet, but Southernized and had all the standard American illnesses that were considered normal. Mm. This is the other thing too. All these people are sick and they're mm. like, oh, this happens when you get a certain mm -hmm. age or this, you're supposed to have these things. Diseases really run in families because <laughs> diets run in families. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So in the film, um, once I saw Cowspiracy, my daughter was born, I caught, saw Cowspiracy and this idea came. I went on a journey. Victoria was the first person I interviewed in New York and then I interviewed Dr. Tuttle. Mm -hmm. I got to go to the Animal Rights Conference in 2016 and interview several beautiful activists and spiritual people there. And then beautiful things happened. Like I was invited to go to the UN uh, Conference on Climate Change. Didn't know how we were gonna do it, but I said, yep, yeah, we'll figure it <laughs> out. And somebody from Hong Kong gave us, saw the trailer and like two days later and gave us this, uh, the money we needed and mm -hmm. sent us off. So we got to go there and we got to go to India for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we just interviewed some amazing people. Mm -hmm. You know, Rabbi Shmuley is, uh, I don't know if you know who he is. He's a, his charisma is just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and all throughout the whole thing, you know, we get, we visit, I get, my daughter got to travel with me as well. I, her and this uh, Israeli uh, veterinarian, we travel to 13 states and we go interview people and we also go to sanctuaries where we meet animals. We go to uh, farm animal sanctuaries and also primate sanctuaries. Um, and we're always reminded, we always come back to the woods, we and my daughter in the RV and in the, just for little bits, we come back and we're reminded that this is why we're doing it. We're doing this for the children. Mm. It's very clear that this journey was started because I woke up to the fact that this environment is not going to be suitable for my daughter and her children. And I just want all parents to, to see this. I mm. mean, in the end, what I say in my prayer in the end is I pray that each of us, myself included, will be more compassionate in our daily choices. Mm. We'll vote wisely with the dollars that we're spending because that's where the world we creating happens. Mm. When we put down that dollar, on violence, and we are adding violence to the world. If we put it down on peace and organic and on local and on love and on things that matter, we'll have that in our world. So mm. I feel in the end, the film is to empower people, to make them realize that they are the only power on the planet and their choices is what create it. Please consider that, meditate. I really want people to meditate because that I know when you go within, whatever religion or non-religion you are, the studies have been done on meditation and they show that they do improve your health. Mm. But I'll tell you, they also improve your connection with your ideas, mm. with whether you, you want to say this came from spirit or whatever. I have 
like I said, as a single dad living in an RV with no money, I did a lot of traveling and did a lot of amazing things in this film. And I felt through the meditation and through unseen forces, I was led and everything opened up perfectly. So I have this faith I never had before. Mm. I had a little faith, but I have lots of faith now. <laughs> and I want people to go within and find that faith that all the great teachers were trying to get their students to learn, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven being within, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Mm. Why did they teach me meditation when I was in church? Mm. That's what he was teaching people. He was. You know? Yeah. You know, they, he, he talked about the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. He Go within and measure everything against the spirit. Mm. Don't just go blindly by these words on paper, mm. which you were seeing people do who follow him. Mm. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's not covered in the movie. <laughs> we don't get into anything like that. All we do is we look at compassion mm. and the beauty of each of these paths, and we show, we hold up and show how veganism is in alignment without ever saying that. It's just, it's implied. It's there. Then so he, much of it, just so much. I wrote all these notes I wanted to put in the movie, and I look, and I didn't, I didn't get to say a lot of them. But they you were can make all a there. second They're one. All implied. <laughs> we are. Oh, we're good. Already, we're already well, in. I'll save that for for the end of the interview. But my my next question to you both is: um, so compassion is something that all human beings, well, most human beings, ninety nine percent of human beings, unless you're a psychopath, we probably don't feel any compassion. But um, do you think human beings are born with compassion built into us, or do you think it's something that we have to learn as children or we're taught? Victoria, do you want to just go? Yeah, I, I am convinced that it's built in. Um, that Remember, there was a big health book back in the 1980s. Uh, so maybe you don't remember, but it was called Fit for Life. It, it sold almost 50 million copies around the world. And um, the, it was a husband and wife team. But the man always would tell a story. If you put a, a toddler in a room with a bunny and a bowl of grapes, and she eats the bunny and plays with the grapes, I'll buy you a car. And that's just such a wonderful illustration of, you know what, we know who has feelings and who doesn't. And it's educated out of us, unfortunately. I think many people remember when they first learned what meat was. And unfortunately, most of us are never taught what dairy really is or what eggs really involve. But I think many of us remember when we learned, oh, my gosh, meat is an animal. And here is this person I love and respect telling me that I'm supposed to eat it anyway. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's innate. I think we just have to be reminded of it mm. and, and nurture it and celebrate it. You know, one of the problems I think in our culture right now is that we celebrate some traits that maybe aren't that celebratory. And some of the ones that we should really be thrilled about, like compassion, don't necessarily uh, get the top billing. But in films like this, and in this whole movement that we're all a part of, uh, it's coming up in the world. Mm, absolutely. Anything to add to that, Thomas? Um, I, I forgot what was the question. <laughs> I was so engrossed with what she was saying. Yeah, I really, I, it, are we born with compassion? Is it built oh, into us? yes, for sure. You know, like uh, as a father and having been around a lot of children since my daughter's been born, I see it immediately. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a, it, every child seems to look out and when they see a, mm -hmm. an animal like a cat or mm -hmm. anything suffering, they are any they perceive, they, they go for it. They try to make it better. I watch my daughter. She's one of the kindest people I know, you know. Um, I, sometimes, it, you know, kids may be, like, not as kind to their parents. But when you watch them, you see them with other kids and you see them with animals. Mm -hmm. And it just melts my heart. So, yeah, I believe that it's a, a natural well, part of who we are. And adults have it as well whenever yes, yes. it's an individual animal. Yes. Uh, I was at an outdoor cafe and there was an injured pigeon here in New York City. We are blessed with lots of pigeons. And all of these women seated at different tables around me and most of them were having salad with grilled chicken on top or grilled salmon or something like that. And all of a sudden, this pigeon became the most important issue on the planet. Somebody was calling the bird rehab place, somebody was going out to hail a cab, somebody was going into the restaurant to get a box to put the pigeon in, and everybody really joined forces to save this one being, and then they all went back to eating their chicken, and, and there was just 
the disconnect. Mm. And so I think it, one of our, our jobs, you know, as vegans, as compassionate people, is just to very gently awaken people. And oh my gosh, I just heard birds singing. Mm. <laughs> but that's the, that's the irony of what we are as creatures, isn't it? Like we are walking paradoxes. You know, most of the time we go around with this cognitive dissonance. And one side of our brain is saying, do this because of our cultural conditioning and cultural programming. And on the other side, our heart or our compassionate center is saying, don't do it. So I think a lot of humanity goes around um, in, uh, in a state of like um, the disconnect, but also this tension, this, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, you know, two sides of us fighting each other. Mm. As a Buddhist, um, I, you know, our, my, my faith and religion is non-the- non-theistic, non-theistic, so we don't worship a deity or, or anything else. But I do sort of have a sense that, you know, compassion for me is like a godlike energy. And then kind of the opposite or the, em- the absence of compassion for me is, you know, you could say if you wanted to give it a name, devil-like or demonic, you know what I mean? Where you have two opposing forces, light and dark, life and death. And, you know, they're not necessarily in, necessarily intrinsically good or bad. It's more that they're opposites and that mm. one creates life and, and one destroys and that they're both important part of life. Because obviously death and destruction is a, an important part of life in this universe. Not everything can and should last forever. Um, and that's what I think that like, we're emerging as creatures into this world. We're emerging into our compassion as what I believe fragments of all that is each one of us as individuals and it's up to us to journey towards the other side of compassion from the darkness from the emptiness into this kind of you know the christians call it the light away from the darkness so um that's what fills my heart with with pride and um and hope is that you know humanity is a young species we're emerging into this compassion emerging into beings of creation rather than beings of destruction uh, Celeste Rao talks about us being beings that have moved from or have the potential to be quite parasitic. You know, we, we consume and destroy wherever we go. But we also, unlike a standard parasite, have the ability to create, to plant trees, to repopulate forests, to clean rivers, to create incredible technology that can transform, to reinvigorate anything and everything. And so I am hopeful about the future, but time is ticking <laughs> and uh, we are running out of time. Um, not just in the interview, but also, you know, <laughs> life, you know, what, how, what keeps you both feeling positive about the future? What keeps you going as people? Well, as a vegan, I think I have more energy than most people my age have. And you just reminded me that one of those reasons might not just be because I eat lots of beautiful foods from the earth, but also because that, that argument, that, that tension was lifted and so there's a lot of energy that comes from not having to keep that internal uh, debate going but I think for me I have to keep it really simple and and I do have a 12-step background and I'm very much into the one day at a time and and living every day in a day tight compartment so what can I do in this 24-hour period to, to move the meter a little bit forward towards compassion. And one huge thing, of course, that I'm doing now is joining forces with this incredible filmmaker. And so people are, are showing the film all over the world uh, in theaters and churches and synagogues and schools and libraries and everything like that. And to just know that that's happening and so much other work is being done by other people, authors and filmmakers and podcasters and entrepreneurs. So to focus on that and still be aware, of course, of how far we have to go, I think that keeps me realistic and hopeful. And you, Thomas? Well, you know, taking this journey has given me a lot of hope because, as Victoria said, I've met so many people working on this issue from so many angles, and I've come to see it as like we've got this big boulder, and we're, once we get enough hands on it, we will roll <laughs> this thing, and we're getting hands in every direction. So mm. that gives me a lot of hope. The other thing that gives me a lot of hope is the fact that everybody I meet, whether they're vegan or not, is full of compassion. Once I speak to somebody, we start talking, I can feel it within them. And it's about that oblivion, obliviousness that people are unaware. And they don't really want to be aware because they're afraid of what the options are. They don't realize how 
wonderful it's going to be yet. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to be the shining example of wonderfulness. But seeing people who are not vegan or who may be vegetarian and not vegan watch this film and change has given me hope that if we can present it to the people in a way that they can hear us and not tune us out, they will be open and most people will consider changing or make some change and a lot of people are making the full change mm -hmm. and it's really i was not expecting it quite the way <laughs> it is happening amazing <laughs> you know yeah amazing yeah. before i uh, let you both go could you let me know how um the audience can uh, find out more about what you guys are doing and what's in in, in the future for both of you well, I live uh, online at MainStreetVegan.net. I know in uh, the UK, you guys have a high street. Over here, we've got Main Street. So I am Main Street Vegan. I'm also Main Street Vegan on all social media. And I do have a page on my website. Uh, it's not obviously the film's website. Tom will, Thomas will tell you about that. But I have a page there, and I'm trying to keep up with all the screenings and where everybody can see the film uh, in their area and, and, of course, do a screening as well. And you can find out there about my, my podcast, my books, and um, the school that I run that trains vegan lifestyle coaches in a magical week in New York City. Amazing. That's great. And Thomas, tell us about uh, where people can find you. Uh, you can find me at uh, our, the main place you can see the screenings is at our Facebook page, at the moment anyway, uh, Facebook slash Compassion Movie. And uh, our website which is is nice but i've got to update and put the challenge on there's this whole challenge associated with the film um that is a prayer for compassion.com mm -hmm. a prayer for compassion.com and it will be constantly updating over the summer and eventually it will have everything there that we need as far as the challenge amazing yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited to uh, launch the, the premiere here in the UK on the 23rd of May. So if you guys are watching and you're in Europe or in the UK and you feel like flying over, please click the link below to grab your tickets. Um, we're going to be uh, having a Q&A after the film, aren't we? Uh, Victoria, who's going to be joining us in London? Well, Thomas and I will be there. Amazing. And Thomas's delightful little daughter, Melody, that uh, she's just such an important part of the film. And uh, we kind of hear a rumor that maybe Ivana Lynch might be joining us. Yes. Uh, we'll keep, she's yes. just That'd be really great wonderful, if she can. Yeah, she's a wonderful supporter of the film and an amazing, amazing uh, influencer and, and thought leader. Fantastic. She's just <laughs> one of the best. Any, any parting thoughts before I let you both go? I would say... Um, I'm just grateful for anybody who's watching this because even if you're not vegan, you must have an interest in it. So thank you all for the, what you're doing to make a better world for my daughter and for future generations. Know that you are making a difference. Every day that you do not consume an animal, you are making a huge difference in this world. And you are a hero. And I am, applaud you. Thank you so much. And if you get to see a film, let us know what you think. And you can, anybody can do, have a screening around the world thanks to the Veg Fund grant we have. Contact us at thecompassionprojectfilm.com uh, and let us know. And if your screening is free to the public, we, the Veg Fund will pay for your licensing fee and we will get you the film and we will help you get it out to your church or to your local community group or whatever you would like. Please contact us and thank you for making the compassion a choice. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a real privilege and honor to have you both. I look forward to seeing you in London really soon. Um, it's been a real joy, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching. Thanks, and thank thanks you. for all thank you, you do, Ravi. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you.